For many, the New World is seen as the land of exploration and new discoveries. As it stands, most of the New World has yet to be explored and remains uncharted. The reason partially lies in the fact that even within the known region, we are constantly making new discoveries. In recent times, hunters and researchers have reported the findings of large chunks of gold scattered across the continent. While to some, this may just be like finding Zeni on the trade yards of Astera, the appearance of these gold fragments point to something much grander in scale. To find the answers, we descend into the hollow remains of a volcano near the Elder's Recess known for containing the largest deposit of gold known in the world, the Caverns of El Dorado. El Dorado is comprised of four main chambers, two of which that are closer to the surface and contain most of the plants and animals that call this place their home, and two others that are near the heat of the still beating heart of the mountain. In the past, when this mountain was more active, this room used to be filled with magma. As the volcano's primary magma chamber, most of the molten rock and metal was pooled here until geothermal activity would cause the magma to spew out when the pressure became too great. The volcano's secondary magma chamber is where most of the endemic life of El Dorado reside. The reason is simply because the caverns are more easily accessible to both sunlight and airborne life through the side than through the tall central vent. As we go further into the caverns, closer to the mountain's still flowing veins, the temperature becomes nigh unbearable. Even though this part of the cavern no longer has direct access to sunlight, the room is brightly lit by the magma's glow. Unlike the calm of the upper levels, this chamber is extremely unstable. While stalactites precariously hang from above, one shake away from crashing down below, sudden increases in pressure can cause violent eruptions to occur at any given moment. The last chamber is a bastion belonging to the creature that maintains life as it is here in the caverns of El Dorado. While many may seek to breach the walls, it has been rumored that the very heat inside this chamber is enough to cause molten gold to rain down on trespassers. So for now, the chamber remains sealed shut. Like the other regions, the caverns of El Dorado house only a select species of endemic life not found anywhere else in the world. Most, no bigger than your average feline all adapted to live within its golden walls. Seeds that were carried here by the wind through the openings of the caverns have taken root where the light still reaches, while various species of mushrooms have found their own niche amongst the rock and metal. Likewise, snake bees and other insects have also found residence in this area, and make do with the plants that reside within the cavern walls. The gold scale bats that live here are not much different from those that live outside the caverns in terms of their anatomy, save for the scales that cover their body. They still cling to the ceilings in near-perfect camouflage when they aren't active, and prefer to travel in groups over traveling alone. The differences lie in when they sleep and what they eat. While scale bats are traditionally nocturnal and tend to hunt small rodents, gold scale bats are instead diurnal 
and preferred to hunt less skittish prey that lived close to the cavern floors. Like the scale bats that fly above, the golden helm crabs here have also adapted some of the metal in the environment into their shells as they scurry about scavenging for food. Those that are more successful at finding food enjoy a shinier coat and are more likely to find a mate. However, it comes at the cost of standing out more amongst the cavern floor and becoming food for the scale bats above. But even then, there is no such thing as an easy meal. Tsuchinoko mostly live among the nooks and crannies of the cavern, only venturing out into the open when they are hungry. When they aren't among the cavern walls raiding nests, they lie in wait near those upon which the scale bats feed, and lunge out as the scale bats swoop down on their own prey. The markings on their body, combined with their flat stature, makes them nigh invisible to the scale bats, often until it's too late. While helm crabs present a more meaty choice for the scale bats, their hard shells, made tougher by the gold, make it difficult for the scale bats to penetrate, and their strong legs can grip the ground to prevent the scale bats from prying them over to expose their softer undersides. So to prevent lingering on the cavern floor for too long, they tend to go for much smaller, more accessible prey, like that of the copper kalapas. But that isn't to say they are completely helpless against their airborne predators. Over generations, they have developed powerful pincers able to break rock, metal, and scale bat scales alike. These crustaceans are about the size of a small plate and roam about the cavern floor picking up rocks and eating the microorganisms that live on them. The bits of copper they inadvertently ingest are processed and become a part of their shell. Occasionally, a mutation causes them to instead process gold into their shell, making them much larger and denser than their copper brethren. Much like the aptonauts that rely on grass and other plants for their sustenance, Kalapas are dependent on the rock and metal that are unearthed from the caverns. While Kalapas can clear away the dirt to look for food hidden near the surface, their size makes it difficult to dig down very far. So instead, they rely on other, more capable hands to do the work for them. One of those hands belongs to a tribe of Gajalakas that call this place their home. What sets them apart from the other tribes that are found throughout the world is their access to the metals that are found here. As a result, gold has become an integral part of their culture, incorporated into their weapons, masks, and even their clothes. Workers patrol the caverns on a daily basis to look for hidden patches of gold. When they are successful, it means the tribe has more gold to use, and the Kalapas have more to eat. In the outside world, grass and plants are the root of life. In El Dorado, rock and metal take their place as the ecosystem's foundation, and instead of growing, they are instead brought here by a 45 meter long elder dragon nicknamed the Mother Goddess of Gold, Kulve Taras. Kulvi Taroth was first discovered decades ago in the early days of Astera's founding. In the past decade she's been gone, the caverns have changed and even she seems to know that the place looks different than she remembers. Those cannons weren't there before. When she had suddenly made her appearance, the research commission were eager to learn about the newly discovered Elder Dragon, but could only send a small handful of hunters and researchers to investigate due to the lack of personnel. On her eventual departure, the research efforts went on hiatus and remained incomplete until recently. 
As she strolls through her cavern, she pauses at a fork in her path. Hmm, these paths used to be clear. She will have to do the work herself. Like the royalty she is, Uwe Tarad prefers her walks to be uninterrupted by the likes of boulders and debris. Just as it was before. Each of her powerful steps loosens up the crystal arches that are formed above her until they can be held up no longer. And this time, she was unlucky. Had it not been for the thick gold plating coating her horns, the sheer weight and force of the crystal arch may have caused multiple stress fractures on her horns. But she continues on for reasons beyond her own. It is believed that several parts of Kulve Tarot's body are uniquely magnetic, the strongest of which is along her spine. At the end of her route, Kulve Tarot digs into the mountain to begin her walk anew. Each time she moves through the earth, metal particles attach themselves to her body, fused together by the heat of the mountain. As she emerges, she brings up with her the vital supply of rocks and metal upon which this ecosystem is grounded on. It seems even here, she has some work to do. Breaking down these barriers serves not only to clear her patrol route, but also to reunite the otherwise isolated patches of the cavern floor. In doing so, she ensures that the grazers have equal access to the metal that are stirred up by her long, heavy dress as it tills the soil with each of her passing steps. As Kulve Taroth breaks through the final barrier in her way, Gajalakas excitedly sing and dance as they follow their goddess in the processional. To them, Kulve Taroth is revered as the mother who cares for all life in the caverns, and as the goddess who blesses them with vast wealth. As she nears the end of her patrol, she seems to look around one last time to ensure that her duty here had been fulfilled. With her emergence, enough nutrients have been exposed for this ecosystem to use for decades to come. It is theorized that Kobe Taroth in fact has many other locations that we are unaware of, much like this one where she is the sole proprietor for bringing and maintaining life to those microcosms. Should Kulve Taroth once again disappear for a long period of time, Eldorado will experience a sort of winter, where creatures will hibernate to preserve their strength, patiently awaiting for their mother goddess to begin the cycle of life anew.
receive the latest publications, please consider subscribing to the Borealis Beast Theory Project. If you have your own theories, please share them below for further discussion.